mission I'm going all the way Oh, I'm going all the way With the Lord Say no turning back Oh, no turning back Oh, I'm going all the way No turning back I'm going all the way Oh, no turning back I'm going all the way Oh, I'm going all the way with the Lord Oh, I've drawn oh, the line I'm going all the way There'll be no turning back I'm going all the way I've drawn the line I'm going all the way I'm going all the way with the Lord Oh, my mind's made up your decision tonight to go all the way with the Lord amen that's that's the bride's decision that I will go Eliezer's call has beckoned us and I will go amen your people will be my people amen your God my God let's go before the author of life tonight maybe you have a need that God knows all about you'd like to lift unto the Lord tonight not unto man but unto God may God see your heart this evening Heavenly Father we, we come to you tonight in the spirit of humility in the spirit of the spirit of grace and mercy Father truly grateful for all the things that you have done for us in our life you have done exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think and to be standing in this moment of time to be serving a God that, that's not bound by time. To think that, that one of these days that we are truly going all the way with you. There's not going to be anything that would be able to hold us back, Father. Lord, I pray that such an anointing would touch your children tonight. I ask God that you would strike their hearts, Lord. You see the uplifted hand and you see the need, Lord Jesus, that lays there. Lord, many are the afflictions of the righteous but you are the God that delivers all of them and Father we've had the busyness of life this week and no doubt we've had different trials or temptations come by our way but may we, the, may we tonight just gather under the auspices of Almighty God and may you touch our lives speak words of life to us Lord, I'm reminded back in the scripture where that you would gather your children and the people of God would come and, and hear you begin to preach and preach on the mountain and preach there and you would manifest the loaves and fish. Father, I pray that you would manifest your gifts tonight. Lord, may we accept the things that are for us, Father, and may we turn back everything the devil tries to offer us tonight. Lord, I pray that you would speak lip to ear to each and every one of our hearts, we love and appreciate you, Lord. 
We give you all the glory and honor and praise. Amen. 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 If you have your Bibles this evening, we'll turn over in the book of Genesis chapter 4, verse 3. Genesis 4 and verse 3. Tonight I, I'd like to speak to you on a thought that's been on my heart this week on the power, the power of sacrifice. The power of sacrifice. In Genesis chapter 4 and verse 3. If you don't know where the book of Genesis is, it's in the very beginning. And then we'll be turning over to Isaiah 53, almost directly in the middle of the book there. Very familiar scriptures to us this evening, and I'll just trust that you'll hop right in the, the, the channel of thought this evening, and maybe we can get your minds off the things of Laodicea and the things of the world this evening, and may we just, just be able to just bask in his presence this evening. Genesis 4 and 3, and in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Isaiah 53 and verse 1. The Bible says here, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. May God bless his reading of the word this evening. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. said we'd like to speak to you on this thought on the power, the power of sacrifice. There was once a, a young man that, that came to W.E. Gladstone when he was a prime minister of England. And this young man came to Mr. Gladstone and he said, Mr. Gladstone, I would appreciate your giving me a few minutes in which I might lay before you my plans for the future. He says, I would like to study law. Yes, said the great statesman, and what then? He said, then, sir, I would like to gain entrance to the bar of England. Yes, young man, and, and what then? He said, then, sir, I hope to have a place in Parliament in the House of Lords. He said, yes, young man, what then, Press Gladstone? He said, then I hope to do great things for Britain. He said, yes, young man, and, and what then? Then, sir, I hope to retire and take life easy. Yes, young man, and, and what then? He tenaciously asked, well, then, Mr. Gladstone, I suppose I will die. Yes, young man, and what then? The young man hesitated and then said, I never thought any further than that, sir. Looking at the young man sternly and steadily, Gladstone said, young man, you are a fool. Go home and think life through. Here is, is depicted a young man that, that, that came to a great statesman 
that had prepped in his life and in his thinking how that everything was going to take place and transpire in his future. And no doubt in his mind he had set apart different energies and sacrifices that he would make for worldly gain. But he had never went so far as to the think of the sacrifices that he would make towards the prince of life. He never gave thought. He gave thought to all the worldly things and he gave thought to all the things that would, would help him gain entrance into a greater stature of a human being in the natural realm, but he had not gained, gave any interest and he not gave any thought to the afterlife. And if you have not gave any thought to your afterlife and where you're going to spend eternity, I trust you make those thoughts this evening where, where you will decide. And, and you know, as we think on this thought on the power of sacrifice that, that you find today that sacrifice is so little talked about anymore and, and really sacrifice is hardly seen anymore amongst people because what sacrifice is is sacrifice is serving. Is serving others and, and being a Christian is to, is spending a life of service. That's what a life of a Christian is. And, and, and you know, I found in life that a lot of people want to be served, but they don't want to serve others. They want to spend their time set back and lay back in a lazy boy and let somebody make them happy in life, but they don't want to. They don't want to get up and do anything. They want their children to get up and, and pay the bills for them. Or, or maybe, maybe they, maybe it's a child in their other stance and maybe they get a, get a little bit of a, a head about them and think, well, my parents should provide for everything for me. They're not there to serve anymore. But I remember times, I remember times that, that, you know, everybody, everybody now wants everything just right in the minute or right in the moment but uh, you know one time there was somebody in our family I talked to granddaddy and said hey you know something said you you and all of your business dealings and things you should have created a, a, a green bean picker and a green bean breaker he said I did he said I birthed all of this line of children right here and grandchildren and he said he said, that's what you are. But I, you know, there's a lot of people that just want to put the dishes in a dishwasher and they don't want to have to sacrifice their time of, uh, of just sitting down. But I remember times as we as young people that, that we would sit down and we would sacrifice and we were the dishwasher back then. And, but a lot of people don't understand sacrifice the way that, that, that they, things were back when. And that's not been too long ago. But I find sometimes that there's young people amongst us that don't understand how how life truly was or how, how, li how great we have it in this life. And you know there's very little bit of time that is spent in sacrifice or spent serving God or they, they people, you find it today that people want an experience right now but yet they don't want to sacrifice the time of truly having a born again, a baptism of the Holy Ghost. But if you'll search out your life and look at everything that you do, you will find that everything that you do is involved in a sacrifice. And you may not make it make it be that way, but you know that you sacrifice time for your family instead of coming to the house of God sometimes. Or you sacrifice doing this or enjoyments in times. And instead of having time spent with God, and, and there there's no power in a sacrifice of spending time on in, in enchantments and, and witch doctors and things like that. But there is power in the sacrifice of the Lamb of God. But everything that we do is spent in sacrifice. We sacrifice time for our family. And I believe that we should have time for our family. But I believe that God deserves first place. I believe that, that, that there's people that spend time for their work, but they don't spend time in, in the Bible. You see, a sacrifice... Sacrifice it is the act of slaughtering an animal for an offering to God or it means to give up something valued for the sake of something else more important. Maybe I'll put it in terminology where some of the young people get it or some of the young boys that play baseball get it, but there is such thing as a sacrifice bunt. And what they're doing there is they're trying to advance a runner to the next position. And though they may not get on base, they'll maybe get out, but yet they are pushing, they are advancing the runner forward. And you know, I found sometimes that young people or even sometimes so-called Christians of today, the they don't want to sacrifice their own time just, just to move somebody else forward. What is life's worth then? 
If we're not here to help others, if we're only here for ourselves, then we are becoming a Laodicea church member. But the whole purpose in life is to see somebody else. That I, I mean, my candle got lit, but I want to see somebody else have the same lighting of the candle in their life. You see, sacrifice is something that you're willing to give up for something that you have deemed more valuable. And if you deem the, the life that you spend out in the world or you spend your energies out in the world, and I want to say this to you, that if it costs you your soul, it's too expensive. You may buy a lot of things in life and you may purchase a lot of things and sacrifice monies to buy different things, but if it costs you your soul, it's way too expensive. If it costs you your peace of mind, it's way too expensive. If it costs you faith, if it costs you, if it costs you long suffering, I want you to know it's way too expensive. Now I pray that you bear with me just for a moment here, but the now sacrifice, it's the offering of, of sacrifices. The offering up of sacrifices is to be regarded as a divine institution. It did not originate with man, but God himself appointed, appointed sacrifice as the mode in which, which was acceptable worship was to be offered to him by the guilty man. The language and the idea of sacrifice is throughout the whole entire Bible. It pervades the whole Bible of offering and sacrifices. We see that throughout the Bible that there were sacrifices made. And if you look back at the very beginning of the book, you will see the fall of humanity. And after the sinning there stood, there stood Adam and Eve in the presence of God. And God said, depart out of my presence. And he said, I can see, the prophet said, I can see them going. He said, I can see Eve, was see, see her lay her little head over on Adam's shoulder and say, Adam, it's my fault. I was the one who did it, but Adam so loved his wife that he wasn't deceived, but he loved her so well that he walked out with her, which was a perfect type of Jesus Christ. Oh, hallelujah. Who knowed no sin, but came to the world and taken the sin of his wife, the church, and walked to death with her. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There they go, there, there, there's all the great Jehovah looking at them. There goes his son, there goes his daughter. I hear something going like this. What is it? It's the clapping, a slapping sound. It's the bloody sheepskin beating against Adam's legs. And he said, wait a minute. I will put enmity between the woman's seed and the serpent's seed. What was he promising? He was promising a promised redeemer that would come and take away the sin of the world. He was speaking of a sacrifice that was to come. You go back to the very beginning and you'll find that God laid down the program right in the Garden of Eden that there was to be a sacrifice. You see, but man tried to make his own religion. He made himself a fig leaf and he tried to cover himself. But you know there was no power in those fig leaves because God seen right through those fig leaves. And you can try to cover up your sin. You can try to cover up your mistakes, but God is looking right through that covering. You see, there's only one thing that will cover you from your sin. And I'm not just talking about a covering. I'm talking about a remitting of sins. For the Bible said that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. But where there is the shedding of blood, there is remission of sins. It was the blood that brought them back into fellowship. There was power in the sacrifice that allowed God to commune with his children again. Whoo, hallelujah. There was no power in the fig leaves. There's no power in denominational ideas or creeds and dogmas. That won't cover you. But there's only one thing that will cover you from your sin that will totally annihilate your sin, and that's this blood. And I want to say to you that there's power in this blood. There's wonder-working power in the blood of Jesus Christ. God hates a powerless religion. 
What Adam had was a powerless religion. He couldn't do anything for him. He couldn't bring him back into communion. But you know where the blood is. There is power at. You see, according to God's command, as we look at the animal sacrifice, the animal that sacrifice had to be physically perfect in age and condition. There could be no blemish on this animal. Hallelujah. Through perfection of this animal, perfection was then presented to God. You see, this was symbolic for the people and to present themselves perfect before God by presenting the perfect one in their place. You know, Jesus told us to be the therefore perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. But you know, there's nothing in your own works that can make you perfect. There's nothing that you can do to make yourself worthy. There's nothing that would make you be of full honor. In your own righteousness, they're filthy rags. But I want you to know in turn, the blood of Jesus Christ takes your sin and makes it righteous. He makes you holy. He makes you poor, pure. He makes you just. And after the animal was selected and presented at the altar, the first act was laying on hands by the person that was presenting the offer. Here he was, he would take the lamb or he would take the animal and he would bring him up to the high priest or however the order was. And how he would bring him up and he would present him there because there was an innocent lamb that was going to give his life for the guilty party. And here the worshiper comes up and he brings, he brings up the sacrifice and this sacrifice would allow him to commune with God. And when the guilty person would bring up that animal, he would come. And as the priest would slut, as he would cut the, 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 the animal's throat, when he would slit his throat, he would lay his hand upon that animal. And as the innocent animal's life was going out, this was symbolic of that in which we do now. We lay our hands upon the sacrifice and it makes us pure. It makes us identified with our sacrifice. Are you with me tonight? This was symbolically pointing to the Savior who would do this for the believers in which they could not do for themselves. He would take upon himself the sin and guilt and blame and shame and all of the pain and accomplish redemption for his people. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I know there's a lot of people that like to claim the blood of Jesus Christ. They like to claim that they are Christians, but Christ came to save his people. Come on, somebody. The blood was shed, but it is for those who were God's people. There is so much power that it can cleanse a universe. Oh, hallelujah. You look over in the festival of the Day of Atonement, there was two goats that depicted this redemptive act. And one goat, there was two goats that depicted it, but one goat it died its death symbolizing how the ultimate sacrifice in the future would pay the penalty for the believer's sins. Its blood was applied to the mercy seat in the holies of holies when the high priest would walk in there and sprinkle the blood upon the mercy seat. Oh, hallelujah. Symbolizing how the great sacrifice would cover the people's sins bringing them into God's presence and make full restoration to God. Hallelujah. And then to the head of the second goat, the priest symbolically transferred the sin of God's people upon the second goat. Hallelujah. Then this goat was known as the scapegoat was sent into the wilderness to symbolize the removal of the people's sin. If you go over in the book of Leviticus 16, you'll see all of these things, how that they transpire. 
and how that a strong man would take that scapegoat, a man that was fit to do the job, would walk him out into the wilderness just like Jesus Christ walked your sin all the way out into the wilderness. It had to be a fit man for the job. It had to be a strong man for the job. Oh, hallelujah. There was not two goats, but Christ represented both goats. He is both your death and he is your resurrection. I am identified when he died with him and I am identified and I rose with him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. To know him, you don't have to know a whole lot. You only have to know one person and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Tonight is not about you falling in love with me or falling in love with the music or falling in love with our excitement. I don't want you falling in love with me or my preaching for I will fail you. But if you fall in love with Jesus, too many people got themselves a personality that they want to follow. One of these days, this old flesh may die and rot, but where will you be if I die? If the pastor dies, you ought to so love God, no matter what he takes away from you, that you'll still sacrifice to God. Oh, I wish somebody helped me preach tonight. To know him is life. To know him is life. To know him as your personal savior. To know him as the one who has filled you with goodness and mercy that sent the world away from you, discharged it and sent it away like the scapegoat in the Old Testament to go into the wilderness to be killed no more. And the very thing that made you sin and do things that you used to do has been driven away from you. Oh, what a savior we have tonight. Oh, what a Savior we have. Isn't this Lord Jesus lovely? That the things that you once fell trapped to, when the devil knew your weaknesses throughout your lineage, that you fell trapped to, this same Lord Jesus Christ drove these things away from you. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Somebody say it's been drove from me. I believe that this lamb, this lamb is perfect. I believe that there is so much power in this sacrifice that there is healing in the sacrifice. And I don't believe that God can just keep you or or I don't believe that God can just heal you once, but I believe that you can stay healed. I don't believe you have to keep dealing with it or here, well, I'm healed now and in two more weeks, I'm, I'm gonna go battle the same thing. Let the healing virtues of Christ that flowed down from Calvary flow over your vessel and stay healed. It's God's will that you stay healed. I believe there's so much power in this sacrifice that one of these mornings, it's gonna raise you up between six and nine. There's so much power in this sacrifice that the devil don't know what to do with you. There's so much power in this sacrifice that it'll set your soul to fly. There's so much power in this sacrifice that the demons of hell can't surround you because there's angels there to guard you. There's so much power in the sacrifice. Power. He thought you were of great value, so he gave up himself. You can imagine how that Adam and Eve, after walking out of the garden, and there stood the seraphims with the flaming swords guarding to the tree of life, how that they would walk out and no doubt they would have conversations with the boys. And they would sit down and they begin to tell Cain and Abel what it was like in the garden. Oh, in the garden, 
It was perfection. In the garden, it was sublime. There's not enough words in the vocabulary to tell you how perfect it was, boys. But these briars that you're dealing with now, they were not there in the garden. That rheumatism medicine that I have to take now, I didn't have to take it in the garden. Those wrinkles you see over my brow, they weren't there in the garden. You see, in the garden there was perfection. In the garden, I could just speak to the mountain and the mountain would move. In the garden, I could speak to the breeze and the breeze would stop. Oh, hallelujah. And in the garden, in the garden, there was no violence there. There was no trials there. There was no temptation there. In the garden. And these boys heard this. And these boys, the prophet said, that the boys wanted to get back to that garden. All of humanity as a Christian, as humanity throughout the years has spent their life getting back to that garden. But I want to tell you, we're going to a place of perfection that there is no more sickness. There is no more rheumatism medicine. There is no more aging. There is no more back pain. But that's not just for there. I believe you can live in perfect peace right now. I believe there's so much power in the sacrifice that you can be healed right now. You're a son and daughter of God. Speak to that mountain and watch it be moved. Everything may be violence around you, but you can be surrounded by a perfect blood. The prophet said that your name is indelibly wrote, hallelujah, by the blood of the lamb. That means that your name cannot be erased from it. Satan has tried, has done, he has done his very worst to try to mark out your name. Woo, hallelujah. But I want you to know how much Satan is against me. It may be stacked up way this high. It don't matter if it's high, as high as, a, as the highest towers in New York City. He can try his very best to knock me off the book. But my name is indelibly wrote there. I hope you don't mind me because I'm going to be there. I want you to know I sure don't mind spending time with you in worship because I believe you're going to be there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Wonderful, wonderful things of God. These boys were both religious. I look over in our scripture reading, these boys were both religious. These boys both came to worship. They both built an altar. They had themselves a church. They both offered sacrifice. They both were sincere, but if that's all that is required, if that's all as far as you have gone in your experience is that you have offered up what, what little bit that you know, you have not went far enough. Come on, somebody. If all you think it is is just coming to the house of God and that's good enough, well, nah, never mind. I'll just stay home and I'll stream. You've not gone far enough yet. Cain was a worshiper. Cain confessed. He wasn't a hypocrite. He believed God. He worshiped God. He knelt down and prayed. The prophet said he was a good church member. Oh my. You look and you watch Cain as he's bringing in the sacrifice. Here he is offering up his sacrifice bringing in of the fruits of the land. But life doesn't lay in plants. Life only lays in the blood. Here Cain was showing where he was from. And Abel, as he takes the grapevine and he begins to wrap it around that lamb's neck. 
and he starts leading it up the hill and he starts bringing it up to the altar that he's built. And then he takes that innocent lamb and lays it upon the altar. He caught the revelation of worship. But why did God receive Abel and condemn Cain? Because that Abel had recompense under the reward. Because Abel had a spiritual revelation. A spiritual revelation of the will of God. He caught the revelation that it was blood. He understood that it was not apples or pomegranates, whatever they choose to say today. That kicked them out of Eden. I was on a wagon one time in an apple orchard and I was riding down through there and there's a bunch of people on there and I was on the back of the wagon and there was somebody up the front of the wagon and they was telling that they had just found out that it was no longer apples or pomegranates but it was a bright red fruit. I thought, oh, if you just give me a chance, I could tell you what fruit it was. It was the pear on the ground. It was not the apple in the tree. But I think they would have kicked me off the wagon after I went ahead and told them everything that there was true. Science has spent all of its energies trying to find the missing link. But I can tell you and I can point you to a Kentucky hillbilly prophet that could so mind boggle the scientists of today. They can't find it. But yet a prophet looked all the way back and seen what it was. Woo. Let me move on. He understood that it wasn't fruit that caused the fall, but it was the blood that brought them back into communion. Notice what Brother Branham says in here and recognizing and acting on the word. He said, but look, the church carnal, it's just the church carnal. They never are able to get above the little thing of I join church. If I go to church, I, I, if, I, if I do the best I can, that's all God requires. Now that's the same thing Cain done. He went and made an altar. He made a sacrifice and brought the fruits of the land and he said, here it is. God, that's the best I got. Take it or leave it. That's the way the carnal believer does today. Lord, I'll go to church. I'll join the best group that I can find. I'll pay in my dues to the church. I'll do what's right. Here's the best I can do. I'll help buy some coal for the widow or I'll, I'll give the children some clothing. Them's all right, nothing to say against it. But that's it, that's all. If you want it, if you want it, take it. If you don't, you don't have to take it then. Now that's the attitude of the church carnal today. Take it or leave it, God. Here I am. You can listen to doors and doors. He don't want just a door to your bedroom and he don't want just a door to your living room. He wants the door to your closet. He wants the door to your upper room. He wants the door to your heart. But God, I'll let you come in this far, but don't you go to meddling in the rest of my business. You've not gone far enough yet. Church carnal wants to go, oh, well, that's all I got. Take it or leave it. But the church spiritual... Able by revelation, by grace, he seen beyond that. And by faith, he offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. And it testified of his righteousness. Notice Cain's attitude. The prophet said, if, if Cain would have done like his brother Abel, God would have accepted it. I know I just choked some of you, but go ahead and swallow that one. But if Cain would have done like Abel, God would have accepted it. Amen. But Cain showed where he was from when he hated his brother. He showed who his daddy was. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And Abel showed who his daddy was. Amen. He knew that there was power in the sacrifice. He knew that this would bring communion to him and God. Out of sacrifice, it's going to cost you something. And what you're willing to sacrifice shows how much you want something. You watch people spend four and five dollars for a box of cigarettes. 
You see the sacrifice that they've got. They'll sacrifice their children's money just to buy a pack of cigarettes or six pack of beer that won't last them through the night. Ain't no happiness in that. But yet they'll sacrifice their hard earned money. Or maybe their bummed earned money just for a pack of cigarettes that they know is gonna put cancer in their lungs. But in every sacrifice, there is a cost to it. You can look all throughout the Bible, the burn offering and the drink offering, the fellowship offering and the guilt offering, the heave offering, the meal offering, the meat offering, the peace offering, the sin offering, the thanks offering, the trespass offering, the wave offering. In every one of those sacrifices and offerings, there was a cost to it. It would cost the worshiper something, maybe a lamb or turtle dove, maybe the meal or the land. It would cost them something to bring them back into fellowship. Esau, it cost Esau something one time. It cost his birthright to sell out for a mess of pottage. Oh, hallelujah. But it only cost Jacob a mess of pottage for the birthright. You see, Esau's attitude towards it showed where he was from. But Jacob's attitude towards the birthright showed that he was elected. It's going to cost you something. Samson knew that it was going to cost him something. Samson, you see, God, he gave God his strength, but he gave Delilah his heart. Samson gave out the secret of his strength, and the Philistines came and overtook him and bound him, plucked out his eyes. And the next place you find Samson is down in the prison house ground, grinding meal. But Samson come to the final moments of his life and he was willing to sacrifice. He said the trouble of it is today the church is not like Samson. They're not willing to pay the price. Samson prayed right when he prayed, Lord, let me die with the enemy. He knew that it was gonna cost him something. He knew it was gonna cost him something. It's gonna cost you something. It's gonna cost me something, your social prestige, your place and position in the denomination. Lord, let me die. He knowed it was gonna cost him something. And you must be ready to die out to your enemy to get in the blessings of God. Samson, was willing to pay the price to get the power of God again upon him. He was willing to pay the price. He was willing to sacrifice his life to get the power back one more time. And the prophet said, are you willing? I wonder if you're willing to sacrifice your energies, sacrifice your time on the internet or sacrifice your time on Facebook just to spend time in his book. Our pastor asked you last weekend, how many of you got a struggle, you struggle to pray, you struggle to read your Bible, and all of you, about every one of you raised your hand. It's a sacrifice to do it. But it's a sacrifice of love. The reason why you, you, you struggle so much is because there is an enemy that's trying to keep you from the promises of God. He's trying to block you from the promises of God. But are you willing to sacrifice your all to get the power back? Do you remember how it was when you first gave your heart to the Lord? How that everything seemed new. Everything was just perfect. Why can't you have that? Why can't you have when you walk back in and all of a sudden you're just like in an oasis in the desert? Why can't you have that love like you first had? Don't leave your first love like the Ephesus church did, but go back to that love. You know, we're willing, we're willing to spend time in prayer for a headache. We're willing to spend time in prayer for healing. 
are willing to spend time and for a little maybe petty things, but we're not willing to sacrifice ourselves on the altar. We're not willing to die out all the way because we want to hang on to the world. The prophet said, what's the matter today is, he said is that the church has moved its altar down to the basement. And he said, the only fire that they got is down in the basement, hallelujah. He said, but what the church needs is an upper room, old fashioned Pentecostal experience that bring the fire back again. I believe you can have that fire. I believe you can have that experience, but you gotta be willing to go all the way. You gotta draw the line and go all the way with God. You gotta go like David did and say, I'm taking back everything that the devil stole from me. You can have that fire back, but bring the altar back into its rightful place. When Elijah rebuilt the altar, and here, here he made fun of all of the worshipers of Baal, and there was no fire that came down. But when Elijah rebuilt the altar and put everything and restored everything back in its place, and the fire came down, what did it do? It was God's approval of the sacrifice. But I wonder, what about you tonight? Why don't you let God come down and consume your life and consume your sacrifice? <laughs> Hallelujah. If you want to check me on this, I got this from Pinterest, whatever you call that thing. Nothing great was ever accomplished without making sacrifices. Boy, that's true. Nothing great was ever accomplished without making sacrifices. I hope you bear with me just a moment. Last month was pastor appreciation. Our pastor was out on an evangelistic tour and I didn't give, get to give my chance. I didn't get my chance to give my normal pastor appreciation speech so I hope you allow me in the month of November. Sacrifice is given back to God. I did, I did some calculations on sacrifice today. On, these are on the low end, so you can add to whatever you want to. But I want you to know I, I'm very much appreciative of our pastor and what he has done for us and done for the kingdom of God. And we reverence, we reverence and respect the gift of God that God has placed in our pastor. And we appreciate his sacrifice upon top of sacrifices to preach this gospel. And we're counting on him. We're counting on him to lead us to the spirit of truth that will guide us, that will be our comforter. We're looking unto him that will lead us to the true sacrifice. But I did some, I did some calculations today and you can be dismissed if you want to. If I get on your nerves or if I burn your hide a little bit, you're welcome to leave. It ain't gonna hurt my feelings. But I, I did some small calculations that average, average driving time to church services weekend after weekend, all the way through the year, that 104 hours he spends driving to church. Normal church service, throughout the years, he spends 312 hours here behind this pulpit. He's gone 14 times just this past year. So on the low end, he spent 336 hours in travel, sometimes more. He spent 224 hours in meetings in the past year. 
sometimes more depending on who he was paired with. So, by doing a rough estimate, he spent 976 hours roughly a year in church. You times that by 36 years in the ministry, 35,136 hours just to be in church. But it didn't just start behind the pulpit. It started at home. So throughout his, throughout the year, he spends 11% of his time just going to church. But I'd say 100% of the time he's a Christian. And I just want to say thank you. There's no way to calculate the cost. To calculate the cost of travel. But you say, well, maybe that's just, that's just Brother Ron. Well, let me give you for an instance, a brother and a family here, I won't call their names so that you don't go ask them all kinds of different things. You see, one soul is worth 10,000 worlds. So no matter the cost the value outweighs the cost. But just a certain individual in his family spends 208 hours a year driving to church, just driving to church. They spend 312 hours in service time. So throughout their year, they have 5% of their year just going to church. They spend 74, roughly $7,400 a year in fuel just driving to church. One soul is worth a whole lot more than $7,400 a year spent. Spent. That ain't, that's 5% of that Christian's, that Christian's year, but 100% of the time they live in this message. You see, a lot of people think, well, man, $7,400, I could really do something with that. But I'd say that for this individual, that if it cost them $50,000 a year, they'd still drive all the way to get to the house of God. No matter the cost, it's worth the sacrifice. Brother Harold Hildebrandt one time went down to Africa and he'd spent hours upon hours upon hours just getting there. He got there, he was war, slap out. And they were supposed to start a meeting as soon as he got there. He went to the pastor and he told him, he said, look, I'm just wore out. I've been traveling. There's no way that I could preach tonight. The pastor began to tell him, well, that's fine if you want to do that, but I just want to let you know this. But there is a certain individual that has walked a hundred miles just to be in this meeting. He said, I'll be ready to preach. You see, we maybe, maybe, maybe we're five minutes from church or 30 minutes from church or an hour from church or an hour and a half from church. But that is a very little bit to churches over in Europe or in Africa where they walk 100 miles or maybe they got to get on a train and ride for 17 miles just to get in the house of God. But it's a sacrifice. But you know if you love what you're doing, it ain't a sacrifice of pain, it's a sacrifice of love. Oh, hallelujah. It don't hurt me to love God. I love loving God. It's not a painful sacrifice to worship God. It's what I love to do. Hallelujah. We didn't get here by luck. We didn't get here by chance, Full Gospel Lighthouse. We sacrificed a lot to get here. You look all over this church and look at the pillars of this church. There was a lot of hours spent in sacrifice building this building. 
A lot of the newcomers come in and they look and think, my goodness, what a beautiful church. But they don't understand the sacrifice that went into building this church, hanging this drywall, hanging that extra rafter up there that our former pastor almost fell all the way through the baptistry. They don't understand the sacrifice of things. They don't understand sisters bringing in meals just right before church time just so they could have a meal and then turn and have church right after that. They don't understand that Brother Homer Frazier would work on this building. He'd spend time working on this building, change his clothes, get behind the pulpit and preach. People don't understand the sacrifice unless they understand or been there. So don't take these things for granted that we've always been here. You remember we started out in a basement. You remember we moved up on the 33 and down to Summit Avenue and God blessed us with this church. And good Lord willing, until the rapture comes, this is where we're gonna be until unless all them prodigals come like I believe they're coming and they pack this place out and we have to rent JMU. But I say, if we got to rent JMU, it's worth the sacrifice. It's worth the cost. And I want you to know, I'm not giving up and I'm not turning back. I'm preaching this till the kingdom comes. Hallelujah. Romans 12 and 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. All those sacrifices throughout the years, throughout the day in and day out, they were at the end of the day, they were dead sacrifices. And God He's a God, he is a spirit. He was not in need physically of the meat offering, but he, it was a commandment to them to offer it up. These were just dead sacrifices, but now he wants a living sacrifice. Somebody that believes that he's worth living for. Somebody that believes in sacrificing their all, sacrificing their energies. God wants a sacrifice of your life. Not just a dead animal on the altar. He wants you on the altar. As Brother Jason said a couple weekends ago, God don't want your peace pipe and he don't want your cigarettes because God don't smoke. He wants you on the altar. He wants your love. He wants your commitment. He wants your service. He wants your sacrifice. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 6 and 5, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. You know, God won't take anything that you don't put on the altar. God didn't come down in the midst of the congregation of Israel and consume all the lambs that were in there in the midst of their fields, but he came down and he consumed the sacrifice that was upon the altar. God's not gonna push you around and he's not gonna push you on the altar and he's not just gonna come down and push you through a pipe and say, blessed is he that overcometh. But God wants you on that altar. He ain't gonna just come down and snatch your dirty habits from you. You gotta die. Hello, God wants you on the altar. He wants you dying on the altar. Well, God, I'll give you my hands. But I can't give you nothing else. You can have my hands. And I'll even lay my old feet up there on the altar so that you can dance through my feet. I'll even lay my... my, upon the altar oh you can have my mind but don't take my heart God don't want just part of you on the altar he wants all of you 
and you go to kicking and screaming. Oh, it's so hard to get up here on the altar. I just, you know, I just don't know. People don't understand what sacrifice it is for me to get lay myself on the altar. He don't want just part of you. He wants all of you. Yeah, he wants your time. Yeah, he wants your energy. Yes, he wants your mind. Yes, he wants your feet. Yes, he wants your spirit. He wants every part of you. You need to grab a hold of the horns of the altar. And you need to grab a hold of them and pull yourself all the way up. And you need to get yourself all the way up there and get good and dead. And we can have ourselves a, a funeral service for the old man. He was good. He always, he always said nice things when everybody was around. But when other, whew, when they walked away, man, he could gossip. He was good for nothing. He was a deadbeat. He hardly came to church on time. He snuck in 15 minutes late so he'd miss the singing and the offering so he wouldn't have to give his tithes. Oh, but thank God the old man's dead. And there's a new man living. You know, there was an old man there. But he don't live there no more. He killed off his malice and his strife and he put on the new man. That old dead man was good for nothing. He lied and he cheated and he stole. But the new man, he walks a little bit different now. He talks a little bit different now because why? He got his whole self upon the altar. He didn't care who was around. He didn't care who laughed. He didn't care who mocked. But he sacrificed his whole entire being to Almighty God. Amen. Tonight, if that's you, come. I invite you to have a funeral service. If you're tired of living in captivity of your mind and living in depression and living in sin, come and let us have a funeral service. I want to invite you to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords that'll make you dress right, make you talk right. He said, well, I don't know how to shout. Let me tell you, put the new man on and he'll shout through you. Well, I don't know how to give 10%. I say, put the new man on. He'll take care of that 10%. You won't be a robber no more. It is more blessed to give than it is to receive. You got time. One more story. It sounds like we're going to have part two of all this. You all are very familiar with the story of blind Bartimaeus. How the prophet would tell about blind Bartimaeus, how that, how that he would make his living, how that he had those two turtle doves, had those two turtle doves that he would set down by the gate. He would go down by the gate and he would have his turtle doves and they would make a little tricks and fly around in the air and flip around and people would throw money down at his feet. That was the only source of income that he had. Sitting down there begging, and those turtle doves would bring in, they would bring in income for him and his family. But the prophet said that one night that his wife got sick to a, to a spot that when, when blind Bartimaeus went home, he went into his prayer closet and he began to pray. And he says, God, God, if you'll heal my wife, in the morning I'll go up and I'll, I'll offer my turtle doves. And that's exactly what God did is he come down and healed his wife and blind Bartimaeus was good as his word. He went up the next morning and he offered up his two turtle doves, his only source of income. 
But in those days, there was no such thing as a, as, a, as a blind leading dog as we have today. But he had a lamb that would lead him. That lamb was his eyes. That lamb would take him through the gate and the lamb would take him back home. It was his eyesight. He would lead him through the city. And he would go and he went back home and his daughter was at a point of death. And he went into his prayer closet and he prayed to God and said, God, if you'll heal my daughter, I'll go up to the temple and I'll offer up my eyes. I'll offer up my lamb. And God come down and healed his daughter and restored her life back to her. And blind Bartimaeus went up the next morning to the temple to offer up his lamb that was his eyes. And the prophet said that when he come into the temple, that Caiaphas was there and he said, Bartimaeus, he said, what's you doing? He said, I've come here to offer up my lamb. And Caiaphas said, Bartimaeus, you can't do that. That lamb is your eyes. You won't be able to go through the city no more if you offer up this lamb. He said, I'll tell you what, Bartimaeus. He said, I'll give you money and you can go buy you another lamb and come back and sacrifice him. He said, Caiaphas says, no. He said, I didn't offer. I didn't offer God a lamb. He said, I offer God this lamb. I offer God this lamb. God don't want your money. God don't want your flowers. God, oh, hallelujah. God wants you on the altar. And God was as good to Bartimaeus as Bartimaeus was good to God. That one day the Lamb of God came by his way. Oh, hallelujah. And he gave him a brand new set of eyes because he recognized the power of his sacrifice that it was worth everything. Oh, hallelujah. You may be in that spot that the son of man is walking past you, but don't let this moment pass you by. You may need your eyesight enlightened, but I say, cry out the more. Somebody may tell you to be quiet. Somebody may tell you that you're getting too much emotion. You're getting more, you're getting more attention than the preachers are getting. But cry out the more. The people around him said, hush up. He's done past you. But oh, Bartimaeus cried out the more, thou son of David, have mercy on me. He's passing by this way. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Are you willing, are you willing to offer your whole self? In sickness and in health. Through good times and bad times. Whether rich or poor. Whether you live in a shack or you live in a mansion. Are you willing to give it all? The sacrifice came and the sacrifice didn't hold nothing back. It was not a Roman spear that took away the life of Jesus. And it was not the Jewish people that took away the life of Jesus. For Jesus said, no man, no man could take my life from me. But Jesus gave his life freely. Oh, hallelujah. He sacrificed his life when no man could take his life. He gave his life because he thought you were worth the sacrifice. He thought that you were worth advancing. <laughs> I hope you feel in your heart what I feel here this moment. I wonder... I wonder if we would just give a little bit more. I wonder if we just give a little bit more time, a little bit more energy, a little bit more praise. A 
little bit more praise, a little bit more time. The Bible says, I'm bringing it down. In Hebrews 13 and 15, that by him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Last month was pastor appreciation, but let me tell you, this month is a month, of November is the month of Thanksgiving. We're moving into a time of Thanksgiving next, next week, but let me just offer you up something right here. I want to give thanks to you for all of your time, for all of your energies, for spending your time in prayer, for spending your energies in worship. And in the atmosphere and the sacrifice of praise, I want to say to you, Full Gospel Lighthouse, thank you. Thank you for your praise. It's just the mortal lips of man saying this. But I want to say to you that one of these days that you're going to hear the voice of God say, well done. But let it be from our lips that we offer the sacrifice of praise continually. Let it not be just when you feel good or when you're full of energy. There's a lot of times you come to the house of God and you're just, man, you know what, I'm just not into it tonight. I got a headache and I, you know, I just, I can't worship when I got a headache. The Bible says sacrifice of praise continually. No matter if you feel up, no matter if you feel down, it's a sacrifice of praise. You may have a lot of battle scars. Let me point out somebody. You may have a lot of battle scars, Brother Jordan, but you're still praising God. You may have a lot of battle scars, Sister Charlene, but you're still praising God. You may have a lot of battle scars, Ron Spencer, but you're still praising God. What about you, church? You may have been through the muck and you may have been through the mire, but let us offer up the sacrifice of praise. You gotta be willing to give it. Breakthrough, it seems like, but I want you to make a sacrifice. You got to give up something to have a breakthrough. You got to give up your meds, give up your energy. I'm not telling you to get rid of the meds, but I'm talking to you about breaking through those medicines. And sacrifice yourself and give praise to God. Well, there's people around me that just won't, just won't worship God. Show him what it's like to worship. You know, I just can't have a breakthrough because this person's talking all service. Why don't you show them how to amen the word? Why don't you show them your sacrifice of praise? I've watched you. I've watched you through your sicknesses, how you came here. When I knew you didn't feel like it, when I knew that you didn't have the energy to do it, but through the pain, through the scars, the enemy was breathing down your neck, but through all of that, oh God, I will lift up the voice of thanksgiving in the house of God. I will offer to thee the offer the sacrifice of praise. There's power in your sacrifice. It's a sacrifice that makes you free. It's a sacrifice that makes you whole. It's a sacrifice that washes away all your sin. You understand that the children of Israel when they were worshiping God after, after they come out of Egypt and they were down there on the Red Sea and Miriam and all them sisters are down there on the banks of the, of the Red Sea and they were praising God. 
Yes, they were free from their captivity. Yes, they were free from their bondage. Yes, they were free from their slavery. Yes, they were free from their taskmasters, but they were not free of sin. When David come dancing 17 miles backwards, he danced so much that he danced his clothes right off of him. David was dancing with lust still on him. David was dancing with sin still on him. If David and them could dance under the sacrifice of the blood of bulls and goats when there was only a covering of their sin and did not remit their sin, what about you and I under the perfect sacrifice? You can dance free from guilt. You can dance free from your mistakes. You can shout. You can shout and offer up a praise because you're free from your sin. You can sing like a bird because there ain't no shame on you. For the Bible says there is therefore no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. There is therefore. Amen. Now, 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 amen. There is therefore, now, amen. You believe that? There is therefore, now. Not somewhere in the future. No condemnation. Tell me, if you're in Christ Jesus, how can you be condemned? When he paid the ultimate sacrifice for you, how can you have condemnation on you? There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. That's why you can see. You think about the dust storm they created when they were worshiping God. They were worshiping under the blood of a natural lamb. But you're not worshiping under the blood of just a natural lamb. You're, you're worshiping under the blood of the lamb of almighty God. And Satan has whispered in your ear that you have no rights. He is my right. He is my authority. I got every right to praise God. It may be a sacrifice for you. But if you could just, oh, get in the spirit of it. I was reading to the young people this past week over in a church age book of getting in the spirit. Brother Branham said that if you would get in the spirit of Isaiah 53, you would recognize, he said, even though you may have pain and you may have, you may have these different things or ailments, but in his spirit, it's all over. You may feel you may remember the things that you've done, but in his spirit, it is all over. I want you to say these words. There is power in my sacrifice. Let the musicians come. There's power in my sacrifice. He made a way for me. He made a way for you. When there seemed to be no way, he made a way. When I couldn't go to him, he came. Thank you, Jesus. He came to me. He came to me when I couldn't go to where he was. He came to me.
Oh, that's why he died. On oh, Calvary, when I couldn't come to where he was, he came to me. Oh, he came to me. to me when I couldn't come to where he was he came to me oh that's why he died sacrifice oh he came to me oh he came to me when I couldn't come to where he was he came to me that's why reach up to you, you reach down to us. I'm reminded of the vision of Brother Branham's son that how he had fallen in sin and was falling and falling and falling just continually to go down. And he was laying there in the hospital and the prophet said, oh God, he's my only son. Don't take him from me. And then he seen as his son Billy Paul was falling and falling and falling. But instead this time, there was a great big hand that began to raise him back up. Father, when we couldn't make it to you, it was your hand of mercy that reached out to us. Through all of our sin, it seemed it was implausible. It seemed like it was impossible for us to go all the way. But you made a way when there seemed to be no way. And the blood cleared our path. And we can walk uprightly justly, purely in your presence. Knowing that when you hear our voice, you're not just hearing our voice, but you're hearing it through the blood. <laughs> Father, what an atonement. What a sacrifice. What a price that you paid. May we never forget the value of what you thought we were worth. Thank you, Lord, for coming to our house.
and speaking the words Talithi Kumi Talithi Kumi Talithi Kumi Talithi Kumi Daughter arise May your children hear those words Talithi Kumi Talithi Kumi Talithi Kumi Talithi Kumi Daughter, arise out of your deadness and be quickened by the Spirit. Thank you, Lord. We love you with all our hearts. He came to me. for your sacrifice of praise for your th sacrifice of thanksgiving for your sacrifice of incense offering up a holy a holy praise to God in this month of thanksgiving may you be thankful for the people that are surrounding you may you lift them up May you lift up their hands. May you hold the banner high and say, you can make it. If he came to me and he allowed me to make it, you can make it. Encourage your brother. Encourage your sister. Encourage your pastor. May God richly bless you tonight as you're dismissed in the presence of the Lord. God bless you this evening.